I mean, it's kind of cute, right? Hello, and welcome back to Kind of Cute. And if you're new here, welcome. My name's Bailey Evan. I'm your host. And on Kind of Cute, we discuss articles from the cut and my general pop culture musings. Oh, y'all, it's been a week. Um, I hate coming out with my podcast late. You might not think that I do, considering I've been late a couple times this month, but it literally tears up my heart and soul. And I'm not saying this is a good excuse, but it is the reality is that my AC is broken and I'm currently sitting in a towel on my bed in my bedroom that has no fan, just dying. Like I do live in Florida. I feel like I'm in Satan's asshole. It's humid as balls. And I I just feel like for some reason, my brain does not work fully and properly when I'm hot. So I just kept putting off recording and just hoping that my AC was going to be fixed. Kinsey and I were doing everything, trying to troubleshoot. Like it it was a whole thing. We didn't fix it. It's not fixed. And I was like, this has just got to happen. The recording has got to happen. On top of that, we also got a new dog last week. His name is Ghost. He's so cute. He's a little Pomeranian, just like my dog, Gergi. And um, he's actually been rehomed. So he, he was from a breeder. Then he was, you know, bought. And then he was rehomed again. And then he was rehomed to us. And he's 10 months old. And we're very happy to have him. And I was asking Kinsey, I wanted to know what his birthday was so that we could know what sign he is. And he's a cancer. But while she was looking at the papers, I was like, I was looking at them. And the original people who bought this dog paid $8,500 for him. Just what? I mean, I don't get it. And like I said, he's a, he's a sweetie, but his tongue like permanently sticks out. He's not as soft as Gurgi. And I'm just like, not that that should be a reason for why you get a dog, but if you're going to pay $8,500, like, I don't know. I just do not, I, I, mm. so I was obviously intrigued about how anyone was getting $8,500 for a dog and why that was a thing. So I look up this company of the breeder that he came from and it's the same breeder that uh, Haley Bieber and Justin Bieber's dog Oscar is from, which is in Davie, Florida. So, I mean, fascinating that they came and probably spent that much for this dog. They have like a little Yorkie. Uh, Hillary Duff has dogs from all these sports stars. Just blows my fucking mind. I'm like, if you're a celebrity, like, I, I don't get, like, uh, why? Just why? <laughs> I don't know. Um, But yeah, so that's that story. I also wanted a little update from last week. I talked about John Mulaney and Olivia Munn being a new couple. And I realized I didn't even address who John Mulaney is. He's a a famous comedian. And I'm bad about sometimes just assuming you might know who someone is. But then I realized he's not – I would say he's kind of B-list. I know he's gained a lot of popularity in recent years and he's gotten a lot more famous. But um, I'd still say he's B, like teetering on A. And uh, I forgot to tell this story that when I was in California a few years ago with my family, we did a trip and we kind of road tripped and we had we were up in like the Carmel Monterey area and we were driving down to L.A. And I had booked us tickets at UCB, um, United Citizens Brigade, which is like a improv place in L.A., they have a lot of other locations too, but the one we were going to was in LA. And I had got these $5 tickets for my whole family and John Mulaney was performing. And so I was so hyped because at that point, like you couldn't get $5 John Mulaney tickets. He was already pretty famous. And um, again, we were road tripping down the state and our tire pops. And we were in this kind of like a minivan situation. And we were in, we were near the Big Sur area. And there's like no service. You cannot get phone service in some areas around there. Our tire pops were on this little like dirt road because we had gone down to this beach area. And I was like, oh, we're it's no way we're making it to the John Mulaney concert or performance tonight. And somehow we we like my dad replaces, puts the spare on. We make it to a tire shop. We somehow get to UCB in time for this performance. And I'm like, oh, my God, we're going to get to see John Mulaney and then he just doesn't show up um and it was because last minute apparently Michelle Obama had invited him on a trip which you know is a valid excuse but I was still a little annoyed and 
I was so excited that we had actually gotten there in time to see this performance and then he wasn't there. So he's a little bit on my shit list for that. I just had to add that story in. Pivoting to another famous breakup, we talked obviously about, you know, A-Rod and Benifer. A-Rod is pairing up with a company to make men's makeup. And I just... (laughs) It's just, oh, it's like such a fall from grace. Nothing against men's makeup. Like, I think I'm so annoyed that men don't wear makeup and that they're just, it's okay. And we've been socialized to think that they look fine if they're a little rugged, they have bags under their eyes, whereas women just have to look like perfect little cherubs all the time. So I am very much for men's makeup. I think it's kind of strange that makeup in general is so heavily marketed towards women And so I get being a man and maybe not wanting like a tart, bedazzled concealer. Uh, So in theory, I'm not hating on this idea at all. I just think it's it's funny that (laughs) the timing of it. I don't know. Maybe that concealer will help him get some more little Madison LaCroix in the DMs. Sour by Olivia Rodrigo just was released. I am devastated that I have not listened to it yet. On top of not having AC, work's been kicking my ass this week. I had these depots go extra long. All I wanted to do was just listen to Sour by Olivia Rodrigo and just bathe in it. But I couldn't and I haven't yet. I literally wanted to do today instead of a normal episode, do like a play by play of each, like a track by track review of Sour. I still might do that as a bonus episode if it is inspires me in that way. Uh, Apparently, Taylor Swift co-wrote one of the songs and they sample New Year's Day in it. So I'm very excited to hear that one. In other pop star news, Ariana Grande is apparently married. She got married in a very intimate ceremony last weekend to Dalton Gomez, who's a luxury real estate agent. They've been dating, I think, a little over a year. I want to say they became public with their relationship at the beginning of 2020. And... Really why I want to talk about this is because I need someone to tell me how I can get into luxury real estate like right off the bat. I don't really want to have to start with the little houses. I want to go straight into luxury real estate because I've been seriously thinking about getting my license for years and then getting my broker's license because that's what those Oppenheimer twins do on Selling Sunset. They're lawyers who have their broker's license and I'd like to say it worked out pretty nicely for them. And It's funny because Dalton is still listed on the Aaron Kinman real estate website, and I kind of figured that he would just let Ariana sugar mama for him, but straight up, you can go on their website and his contact information is still there. I'm sure many Arianators are contacting him to be their real estate agent, but then upon closer investigation, he doesn't have any active listings. So I'm thinking that maybe Ariana really is sugar mamaing for him. And I feel like they're probably spending more of their time in LA or in New York because I feel like that's like where her main uh, pad is. And I was also looking up the listings he sold and I have nothing better to do. So I added up all of his past listings and he's told us sold a total of $50,614,000 in houses. So good on him. And I'm sorry to go down a real estate black hole here, but I was looking at Tinsley Mortimer's Instagram because she's actually been living in Palm Beach full time, which is I live in West Palm. Um, And so I was just curious what she was doing. And she was in New York with two Palm Beach realtors. So I was looking at their Instagrams and this one guy, his name is Chris Levitt, and he sold a house in Palm Beach for please hold your behinds, $140 million. $140 million for a house. Apparently, it is the second most expensive house that's ever been sold in the United States and the most expensive house that's ever been sold in Florida. And the reason this stood out to me beyond its intense price tag is because this house was advertised to me on Facebook. I sent it to my parents and I was like, I'm so glad that Facebook thinks that I am in any realm eligible to buy a $140 million house. But it goes to show like the marketing they must have had to do to get this thing sold was intense because like it was a very nice house. But you think about it like celebs a lot of times will have like $14 million houses like Meghan Markle and Harry's Montecito house that's by Oprah. That one was around $14 million. So It just blows my mind why you would want to spend $140 million on a home that was pretty and nice, but not, to me, just not that different than a lot of Palm Beach houses. 
I don't know. The bottom line is I need to get into luxury real estate. If anyone has an in, please let me know. Speaking of other rich people, we've got Martha Stewart and her peacocks. This was a request from Verge to talk about this. So Martha tweeted, the NY Post again, fake news. They have a story on peacocks today and say I have 16 on my farm. I actually have 21 of these glorious birds whose house is impeccable. They do not smell. They are so clean. Their voices are loud, but such fun to hear. They are so friendly. (laughs) I was reading a town and country article about this tweet. They did like a whole article on it. And they said, it's fair to assume that Stort's tweet was meant to be slightly ironic. The post stayed in character for its correction, adding, editor's note, the story originally reported that Martha Stort has 16 peacocks. Stort clarified via Twitter, she actually has 21 glorious and impeccably clean peacocks. And then town and country went on to state that she apparently has one more peacock than when they interviewed her a few years ago. So apparently she just keeps adding to the collection. And I mean, honestly, hello, you New York Post, you need to fact check yourself. Like you can't just go willy nilly saying how many peacocks people have. Um, but I don't know if I agree with town and country that this was ironic from Stuart. Like <laughs> her humor and her social media style is a little bit befuddling to me. I, I'm not sure how much of it is like in character and meant to kind of poke fun at our society and how much of it is truly just her being a little off her rocker in her statements. Like, I don't know if that stuff with Antony that we talked about extensively on here, their little feud, I don't know if that was really fake or just like drumming up problems. I think, I just think she's she just kind of wilds out on her social media and I love it. It makes it so entertaining for all of us. All right, guys, let's get into our first article of the day. Ooh, Flame and Hot Cheetos drama by Mia Mercado. She writes that today's Hollywood drama is brought to you by Eva Longoria and Flaming Hot Cheetos. The actress is directing a biopic on Richard Montañez, the former Frito-Lay janitor turned executive who created Flaming Hot Cheetos and helped change the financial trajectory of the company. (laughs) <laughs> inspiring delicious goodwill hunting but make it cheetos Afor- unfortunately the story may be based on a lie okay so i wanted a little bit of background on this so i just went to richard's wikipedia and it says that he was hired at age 18 as a janitor for frito-lay in the rancho cucamonga factory in 1976 and according to him a cheetos machine broke down so he took home a batch of just the unflavored snacks like without the powder on it and he seasoned them with spices that were reminiscent of Mexican street corn. And then he pitched this idea to the CEO, Roger Enrico, over the phone. And then he was invited to deliver an in-person presentation. And apparently he did research by uh, looking at marketing at the public library. And he presented the product as appealing to the growing Latino market. And he even gave them little samples and plastic bags that he had hand decorated and sealed. And... It was then soft, the product, the Flaming Hot Cheetos, were launched six months later to a test market in L.A. and then approved for national release in 1992. And Newsweek reported that this thing, this invention of these Flaming Hot Cheetos rejuvenated the brand and it garnered billions in revenue. But then in 2021, this is what this brings us to, you know, present day what we're talking about. There was an LA Times article that disputed this account, reporting that based on an internal investigation at Frito Lay, Montanez was not involved in creating this product line. But that's what we're about to get into. Um, he was also subsequently named vice president in multicultural sales and community promotions for PepsiCo. And he's also a motivational speaker and instructor in leadership. So regardless of whether he did the story is true as written, he really did go from a janitor to a vice president of sales for PepsiCo. I mean, one of the biggest companies in the world. So that alone is so impressive to me. But it's very suspicious because Frito-Lay said in the LA Times article, none of our records show that Richard was involved in any capacity in the flaming Hot test market. We have interviewed multiple personnel and who were involved in the test market, and all of them indicate that Richard was not involved in any capacity in the test market. Okay. Before we move on to maybe Frito-Lay kind of uh, taking back these comments, obviously Frito-Lay wants to say this is a lie. I mean, this is such standard big company shit where they're like, well, you know, let's not give all this credit to this one man. Like, let's not get too hasty. It's also stupid, though, because Flaming Hot Cheetos have been around forever. He's already 
an executive at the company, why are we now going back and rewriting history or readdressing things that happened so long ago? Also, speaking of Flaming Hot Cheetos, when I was a kid, so when in 92, I was like four years old. When I was around five and six and a little older than that, my favorite snack was the Flaming Hot Cheeto sticks. They're like the fries. So they have like a different texture. They're so good. I haven't had them in so many years. But the thing is, those are the only type of Flaming Hot Cheetos I've ever had. And when Flaming Hot Cheetos, I feel like within the past five years have been such in the cultural zeitgeist that I thought they were talking about the Flaming Hot Cheeto sticks. But apparently there's Flaming Hot Cheetos that are like the cheese Cheetos with Flaming Hot spice and I've never had those kind which now that I'm talking about this I kind of like want to go out today (laughs) and sample them because I'm sure I would love them because I'm telling you those I think they're called fries I don't know why I'm called they're the flaming hot cheeto fries are the ones that I had when I was a little kid and they still sell those and those are a bomb if you have not had those anyways (laughs) so this is where the story gets even crazier so there's an NPR reporter and she hosts a show called planet money and her name's Sarah Gonzalez And she actually took an in-depth look at the origins of Flaming Hot Cheetos just earlier this month. And so after the LA Times article came out, she shared some of her conversations with Frito-Lay that actually conflict their statements that Richard wasn't involved. So the company told her that it does not credit the product creation to him and him alone, talking about Richard. But then they said he was part of it. Yes, sure. So they kind of conceded that actually he was a part of it. So Wikipedia, and you speak it fixed, that's all I'm saying. Um, and it says Frito-Lay told Gonzalez it had learned things, quote unquote, from the recently published Time story and that additional facts were brought to light. So again, pretty sus. I mean, come on, give credit where credit is due. Like, it's just, it's such an inspiring story and why they would try to go back on this narrative when actually this narrative is probably helpful to their bottom line and the fact that Eva Longoria is working on this biopic. It's just, I mean, think of all the amazing marketing they can do surrounding this movie. Also, the little Cheeto, Cheetah, a great mascot. Love that dude. Chester. Why was I blinking on his name? Chester, not a great name, but love that Cheetah. (laughs) All right, our next article. Angelina Jolie transformed into a sentient beehive by amanda arnold it was apparently world bee day a few days ago i actually saw britney spears post about that too she kind of alerted me to that fact (laughs) and i also saw this photo that we're talking about and in the photo angelina jolie is uh standing and she has on like a little white blouse um tube top ish looking thing and there's bees a lot of bees on her but not a ton and According to the National Geographic, Angelina wanted to do a portrait covered in bees to mark the holiday. So apparently three days before she took this picture, she had to abstain from washing herself in any capacity. She says, they told me if you have all these different scents, shampoos and perfumes and things, the bee doesn't know what you are. So on the day of the shoot, Jolie also had to put things in her nostrils and her ears to prevent the bees from going in there. And she had to put pheromone on herself. Which, like, what kind of pheromone? Bee pheromone? How do you get this? Can I get some? (laughs) I want to be a friend of the bees. So then she had to sit still for 20 minutes, and the bees crawled all over her, chest, neck, and face. And apparently they kept the room silent and dark so that the bees kept calm. Um, But if you've seen this pic, it really isn't a ton of bees, in my humble opinion. Like, fear factor would be like, okay, can you do more, please? Um, I love bumblebees. They, a lot of times, unfortunately, fall in our pool, and Kinsey and I always take them out and let them dry off and send them on their way. Oh, speaking of bees, remember when I talked about our butterflies a few, a few weeks back? We have two more caterpillars, and one of them's already cocooning, so we're just out here saving the monarch population, guys, um, and the bees. Anyways, this picture, I'm just really underwhelmed with it. Can you guys look at it and tell me your thoughts? And I just, I don't really get it. I mean, again, I love anything about the bees. And I guess this is getting the people talking. It's getting me talking about the bees. But I just think she could have gone a little more all out with this photo. Like, cover your body. You know, I I just wanted more. All right, so for the Cuts May June cover, they have on Padma Lakshmi, and I think she is probably the most gorgeous person in the food world. You may know her from Top Chef, and I had to admit that I used to be 
a big Top Chef fan back in the day, like in its early seasons. But I was not a Padma fan. Like she just came across as so cold and bitchy. But I've come to realize uh, that I just think Padma doesn't take shit. And the more interviews I've read with her and I've seen her like on David Chang shows, I've realized that she really stands up for what she believes in. And again, I, I have to always kind of check my own biases for women on TV and in general and my expectations for them to be palatable and likable. And I think that was definitely affecting my viewpoint of her. But I really love that she kind of takes this no holds bar approach. And I thought this interview was so cool because they had Sola L. Whaley interview her. And Sola was one of the ones who started the whole reckoning at Bon Appetit, which you guys know we love talking about on here. And I thought this little story at the beginning was so cute. Sola says, I'm going to be weird for a minute. I still remember the first time I saw you on TV. You were doing a travel show and you were in Spain eating ham. And I remember just screaming and calling my mom who was in the kitchen. And I was just like, I didn't even know brown people could eat ham. It was the first time I felt like this career was even possible. I don't think that I'd even have the courage to try to do this if you didn't do it first. And Padma says, thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. That's why I've tried to mentor younger women. I just want to make sure you guys had it easier than I did so that we could have more exciting stories. The feeling that you had when you called your mother, that's the same feeling I have whenever I see you. It's just like, yay. Oh, I just, that was so cute. And then I thought, uh, there's a lot of questions. I'm just, that Sola asked, and it's a pretty long interview, but I was just highlighting some of the things that stood out for me. Um, Sola brings up that she doesn't, she thought that maybe there reason there wasn't as much diversity of chefs of color on tv was because they don't have as much mentorship and they can't take off as much time and because of that they might not have a support system to allow them to go on a show like top chef and she asked do you feel like the pandemic created more opportunities for more people to try out and Pama said, that's a great point. I've never thought about it that way. I'm not involved in casting for obvious reasons. It's a conflict of interest since I judge. But I think you have to take time off financially because it's six weeks and then the finale. And you have to be okay with not having a job when you get back. It says Michael Voltaggio did not have a job when he finished Top Chef and he won. So it's a big risk. And I hadn't thought about it that way. And I think that's a really great point for reality television in general. I mean, think about if you're going on something like Survivor, The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, you have to take off a big chunk of time that really might not be accessible to so many people. And it can become self-limiting in that way, even before the casting process comes into play. Um, Sola brings up that she thinks everyone should work in hospitality for a little bit. I've learned a lot of people skills just by working in a restaurant. It's sad that when you're working as a woman server, you get a lot of harassment, but you learn how to hold your own. And Padma says, totally. I worked at a pizzeria and it taught me a lot, including empathy and patience. I think it's imperative. I think everyone should work in hospitality. Now (laughs) I've talked, I think maybe once or twice on here, how my first job was at a Asian kind of fusion restaurant. And All of my friends got to work at the cash register and I was relegated to dishwashing. And on the rare occasions that they would let me out, sometimes I would be able to serve. And it was kind of like a um, counter service place, but you would they would have a number on their table and you would bring them the food. And one time I spilled an entire Diet Coke on someone's lap. And it was one of the most mortifying experiences of my life. And the the lady was just not nice about it at all. I mean, I get it. Like she was rightfully pissed, but it was an accident. And um, I think in that moment, I was like, I am not cut out to work in hospitality. So I totally <laughs> agree with what they're saying. And then they go into the hate that they can get, like that Padma gets for just posting anything. And she says, I'll put up a sexy picture of myself, but I'm proud of looking cute because I've been working out or something and I get shit for that. It's like, listen, I was a lingerie model. When I was 23, 24, 25, nobody said anything negative about me wearing lingerie. Why are you saying that now? And it's like the most tame picture. So so I was like, what did they have a problem with? And she says, like, I'm exploiting myself or fishing or compliments, to which I just say, go fuck yourself. Honestly, everybody has an opinion. and It's easy on social media because you can hide behind your handle. And then Sola kind of references how she feels like she got thrown into the public eye pretty fast and how the thing that's freaked her out the most is people commenting on her body. She says, I've gained weight through the pandemic and my body's just taking care of me in this challenging time. And I get people screaming at me. Oh my God, how did you let yourself get this way? I'm shocked that people feel so comfortable talking about another woman's body. 
and it's sad hearing that people do that to you too. And this is something I will never understand why people think it's okay to comment on other people's bodies. It just, it enrages me, honestly. That's probably the best word for it. I, I think it's so disgusting and base and vile and one of the worst <laughs> things you can do. And, um, mm. and, I was then shocked by the comments on this article because I was really hoping, like I felt like this was a raw conversation and I was hoping that the comments would be kind and uplifting. They were all so rude and disgusting. At the time when I read this article, it had 13 comments. And one of them reads as follows. Where would food be without Padma Lakshmi? Just fine, thanks. Where would Padma Lakshmi be without food? Another struggling anonymous failed model. She's the ethnic version, uh, version of Katie Lee Joel. Literally, what the fuck? And the fact that there was no positive comments on this, it just goes to show that I think we have such a long way to go in being a more compassionate society. And just as a tangent, I'm also kind of repulsed by how women in food are viewed. And the fact that we expect, I think, as a society, for some reason, that women should be good cooks in the home. I know it's so old-fashioned, but I still feel like that sticks around that oh your mom should be a good cook you should be a good cook if you want to please your man and yet if you look at the high level world of chefs as a whole it's so male dominated and it just oh it also enrages me and it's just so not fair (sighs) okay let's get into a deep cut we haven't done a deep cut in a while this one's from august 2017 and since we just did a cover story the one with Padma. I thought it would be fun to do one from four-ish years ago. And this one is Allison Davis, who is one of my faves. She conducts this interview with Aubrey Davis, who is April, or I'm sorry, not Aubrey Davis, Aubrey Plaza. She most famously plays April on Parks and Rec. And I also thought this article was fitting because she actually just got married. And it was so funny to me because big uh, news outlets kept using a picture of the wrong guy they were using the picture of the creepy principal on cruel summer which you haven't if you haven't watched yet get into it as being like the person she married and that is not who she married she just did a movie with him or a show with him a while ago so there was some press pics of him um but she married this director dude who you wouldn't know his like i didn't know his name and they've apparently been dating a long long time and they just got married um the title of this article is The Nicest Evil Girl in the World. And I I, I just love the way Allison spins a tale because she's so vivid in her descriptions. So I want to read you this whole first opening. She says, the first thing Aubrey Plaza says when she pulls up in the parking lot of the Vermont Canyon tennis courts is, I don't really know how to play tennis, do you? The first thing I do in response is to laugh in her face because this must be a joke. It's a hot, nosebleed dry Los Angeles day. There's no cloud cover of trees to protect us from the sun, and the asphalt courts are heating up like a kiln. The only acceptable place for a human is somewhere air-conditioned, but one of us had proposed a rousing game of tennis, and hint, hint, it wasn't me. When Plaza, queen of the deadpan delivery, patron state of the sharp tongue, claims she doesn't know how to play tennis after suggesting we play tennis, my instant and totally unfair response is to assume she's setting me up and will soon be mocking me for sweating perfume like she's a real life April Ludgate. First off, relevant because I am sweating my ass off in my non-air conditioned house right now, so I feel her pain. Um, I don't know how you would effectively conduct an interview while you're sweating profusely. (laughs) And she goes on to explain that the reason this happened is because apparently Aubrey's publicist told her she had to choose an activity and she panicked and she didn't want to pick hiking because that's what everyone picks. So she just suggested tennis and here we are. Um, this interview is right before Ingrid Goes West came out. And if you guys haven't seen that yet, again, along with Cruel Summer, watch Ingrid Goes West. She is in it with Elizabeth Olsen from WandaVision. And it's such a cool movie. I love it. It's it's kind of satirical. It's about April, who's really obsessed with Elizabeth Olsen's character and kind of concocts this character through social media and moves out west to meet Elizabeth Olsen's character and everything that sort of ensues. And it's just, it's it's a really good movie. Um, <laughs> so after they've played tennis for like 20 minutes, uh, what Allison describes as earnest, committed, athletic effort, Aubrey says, we really don't have to do this. We can go do something else. And she suggests getting lunch at her favorite Los Feliz spot, go get him tiger. 
<laughs> so they take Aubrey's car and Aubrey's like, don't look at my car. It's fucked up in here, which is so relatable. Like every time your friend gets in the car, you're like, oh, I'm sorry. It's so dirty. <laughs> so they end up going to brunch and the end of this article really stuck with me because Aubrey says she doesn't want people to think Ingrid Goes West is a condemnation of social media. She reassures me it's okay to love the cheesy Instagram stuff that movies make fun of. Brunch, selfies, inspirational quotes over desert landscapes, and a $100 cacti. I'm really embarrassed at how much I actually like avocado toast, Allison says. But avocado... <laughs> avocado toast is the best Aubrey says you shouldn't be ashamed of that everything is the best that's the thing you can't knock it it's good it's the best and I think this stuck out to me because it really reminded me of our conversation about chuggy and like just like the things you like there's really a freedom in that and sometimes things are popular and overplayed because they're fucking good okay and with that speaking of things that are overplayed but good let's get into legit shit I just got a four pack of big ass hair clips off Amazon and I just feel like you guys need these in your life too. Guys, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but maybe you have a little man bun you need to put up. The colors are really cute. It's like a nude, a green, a pink, a black. They're kind of this matte consistency and oh, sorry, I just <laughs> I just clipped it to test it out. Um, it holds my hair pretty well. It's not like the most hold of a clip ever, but I just think they're really cute and if you've been looking for an affordable big ass clip, I highly recommend them. Oh, and I meant to say, guys, thank you guys so much for listening to the interview with Helen last week. We got a lot of great feedback about it. I loved it, too. I'm so excited again to have some more guests on here. Again, I apologize if this episode was a little bit like lacking brain power. Hopefully my AC will be back in action next week. Thank you, guys. I hope you have an amazing weekend and I will talk to you soon. Bye.